Hello, gang. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Kim Stanger. I'm the head of the firm's Help Law Group. This is the next in our continuing series of uh, compliance related healthcare issues that we're bringing to you. Today, we're going to be talking about the HIPAA privacy, security, and breach notification rules. A couple of preliminaries. Uh, it's hard to cover all of HIPAA in one hour, but I'm going to do my best. Just remember that this is going to be an overview. I'm going to hit kind of the, some of the high points, the things that I think you need to be most aware of to avoid penalties. But remember that it's only going to be talking about HIPAA to the extent that there are other laws, including state laws that might apply. Make sure you're aware of those applicable laws and you consider them when you're applying the laws to any particular set of facts. If uh, you should have received a copy of the slides along with some other written content that I've provided, if you did not receive those, you can email Charles at that uh, site up there on the screen, that link up there at the screen, and he can get those to you. Um, we're not going to be taking questions during the program, but if you do have questions, feel free to submit them to me using the chat feature. You can email me and I'll respond offline. With that said, let's launch into it. We're going to be focusing today on HIPAA, but just remember uh, that there are other laws that overlap with HIPAA. The key there is to understand that when you're talking about these other laws, that HIPAA essentially establishes the floor of patient privacy. To the extent that there's another law that requires more than HIPAA does, either because it gives greater protection to the patient's information or it gives the patient additional rights to their information, then you have to comply with that other law. For example, 42 CFR Part 2, Governing Substance Use Disorder, it is probably more restrictive in, than HIPAA in most situations. To the extent that there's another state law out there that is less restrictive than HIPAA, then you got to comply with at least HIPAA. Let's talk first about the HIPAA privacy rule. There's actually three parts of HIPAA. There's the privacy rule, there's the security rule, and the breach notification rule. The privacy rule is the one that you're probably most familiar at about. Um, it's the one that basically requires you to keep information confidential. What happens if you violate it? Well, you may be surprised to learn that you can actually go to jail for a HIPAA violation. The HIPAA criminal penalties state that if they apply if individuals obtain or disclose protected health information from a covered entity without authorization. The penalties are anywhere from $50,000 in one year in prison up to $250,000 or 10 years in prison. So if you've got an employee who says, hey, I don't care about HIPAA because, you know, I'm not a covered entity. They can't come after me. Huh? You can point out to them that, well, the feds can come after you for criminal penalties. But that's not the one most of you worry about. The one that's most relevant is usually the HIPAA civil penalties. And there's, there's tiered structure for these penalties. The HIPAA penalties can range from anywhere from $127 per violation up to $2 million per type of violation per year. The amount of the penalty depends upon the conduct that's involved. If you don't act with willful neglect, then it's anywhere from $127,000 up to about $64,000 per year. That's adjusted annually. The last publication I think that we've got for the numbers are tw from 2021, so we're about due for another increase. But that's kind of where we're at right now. That's if you don't act with willful neglect. On the other hand, if you do act with willful neglect, then the penalties are anywhere from about $13,000 up to about $65,000 per violation. Now, if you act with willful neglect, those penalties are mandatory. The Office for Civil Rights must impose those penalties. And remember that when it comes to imposing a penalty, if you lose a laptop that has 2,000 patients' names on that, and that laptop was not secured, then that's 2,000 different violations. So the penalties can add up awfully quickly. Similarly, if you don't have a required policy in place, then for each day you didn't have that policy in place from the time that it was supposed to be in place, that can be additional penalties. So they add up awfully quickly. So you want to make sure that you do not act with willful neglect. The good news is if you don't act with willful neglect and you correct the situation within 30 days, that is an affirmative defense to HIPAA penalties. So the government, the Office for Civil Rights, can impose the penalties if you did not act with willful neglect and you um, corrected the situation within 30 days. Now, those are the civil pen penalties, uh, civil monetary penalties portion of it. Um, there are additional enforcement issues out there. 
Um, if you have a breach of unsecured protected health information, then you have an affirmative obligation to narc on yourselves to the affected individuals, to the to HHS, the Office of Civil Rights. And if the breach involves more than 500 persons, you've got to lo notify local media. We'll talk more about that later. Also, in the future, individuals may recover a portion of those penalties or settlements. That was part of the High Tech Act, but the government never got around to actually uh, issuing the, the proposed regulations enforcing that particular portion that would give those patients or affected individuals a portion of those penalties that come against you. So they may kind of turn into bounty hunters in those situations. Now, last April, HHS issued a notice soliciting input on how it should implement these, this requirement. It's not there yet, but it's gonna be coming down the pipe. So just remember that, that realize that it's going to increase the stakes because these patients now can recover some money in some form if um, they turn you in for HIPAA violations and you settle out or the penalties are imposed. In addition, even if you're not concerned about the government coming after you, you you and you're an employee, you need to be aware that your employer is obligated to impose sanctions against you. If an employer fails to impose sanctions, then that employer can be liable for a HIPAA violation. There is no private cause of action under HIPAA. A patient cannot sue you per se for a HIPAA violation, but creative plaintiff's lawyers may use HIPAA as essentially the standard of care. And if they you violate HIPAA, they could argue that it's a, a negligence per se, and they may use HIPAA as a basis for bringing some kind of common law cause of action against you. And finally, the state attorney general can bring their own lawsuit against you, not just the feds, but the state attorney general can sue you for fines of $25,000 per violation plus fees and costs. So you got to take HIPAA seriously. Now, the good news is, is that you can likely avoid HIPAA civil penalties, not necessarily those other enforcement means, but at least the OCR imposing penalties, as long as you do not act with willful neglect and you correct the situation within 30 days. Well, what do you need to do to avoid acting with willful neglect? In general, you need to make sure that you've got the policies and procedures in place that are required by HIPAA. You've got to execute business associate agreements. You need to train your personnel and document that training you need to respond immediately to mitigate and correct if there is a violation and timely report breaches if there was a breach of unsecured information. If you do those things, then there's a good chance that you're going to avoid any kind of willful neglect. And even though there may be a HIPAA breach down the road or a HIPAA violation, you may be able to or should be able to avoid HIPAA penalties. On the other hand, if you ignore those things, all bets are off because that may constitute willful neglect. And remember, those penalties are higher and they are mandatory if the government determines that you have acted with willful neglect. All right, let's talk about to whom HIPAA applies. HIPAA only applies to covered entities and business associates. Well, who are covered entities? Covered entities are all are healthcare providers, but not all healthcare providers. Only those healthcare providers who engage in certain electronic transactions. Those electronic transactions are primarily dealing with like claim submissions, things like that to, to third party payers. If you are a completely paper office, if that's possible these days, then HIPAA doesn't apply to you because you're not engaging in those electronic transactions. HIPAA also applies to health plans, including employee group health plans, if there are 50 or more participants in the plan or the plan is administered by a third party. Um, a lot of people don't realize that HIPAA applies to this situation. So just remember, you folks out there, you know, HIPAA not only applies to you in your capacity as a healthcare provider, but it also applies to your health plan. That means your health plan must um, satisfy the HIPAA requirements if that plan has 50 or more participants or it's administered by a third party. HIPAA also applies to healthcare clearinghouses. Those are the covered entities. In the wake of the High Tech Act, HIPAA extended. Uh, HIPAA requirements to business associates of covered entities. Those are basically the entities with whom you share your protected health information to perform services on your behalf. It's these covered entities and the business associates who can be liable for HIPAA violations if they breach HIPAA. Well, what kind of information does HIPAA apply to? HIPAA applies to protected health information or PHI. That is information that is created or received by a healthcare provider or plan that relates to the past, present, or future physical or mental health, healthcare, or payment 
for the healthcare. It's not only their payment rec or their healthcare records, it's also payment records or anything else that identifies the individual or uh, and that the information is individually identifiable. That means that it's either identifies the individual or with risk with respect to which there is a reasonable basis to believe the information can be used to identify the individual. So you may have a situation where you're maybe a nursing, a famous, relatively famous case where a nursing home employee was going home at the end of the day, posting on social media, oh, patient NB did this to me or did that to me. And when she was confronted, she says, well, I never disclosed the, the name. They couldn't identify him from NB. Well, maybe they could. And if they could, then that's a violation of HIPAA and therefore um, all those potential HIPAA sanctions could come down upon them. Well, what is not covered by HIPAA? Information after the person's been dead for 50 years, I guess we don't care at that point, or if the information is maintained in the capacity other than as a covered entity or healthcare provider. So for example, you are a hospital, you may have a lot of employment records. Those employment records themselves are not protected health information because you're not maintaining those records in your capacity as a healthcare provider of those employees. Even though those employment records may have health information within them, those employment records themselves are not protected by HIPAA. Um, HIPAA doesn't apply to de-identified information. What's de-identified information? Well, there's two ways that you can de-identified information. One is you get an expert to come in there and do a statistical survey and conclude that there's a low probability the data would be compromised. Or alternatively, you suck out certain identifiable information from that information. If there's this list, if you suck out these things, then it's deemed to be de-identified. Things like names, dates, telephone facts, and email numbers, social security numbers, medical record numbers, and so forth. Well, the converse of that is that if you've got in that information, if you're disclosing that information in that list, including just the name, even if you're not disclosing other related health information, if you're disclosing a patient's name and it's in the context of them being a patient, that's a disclosure of protected health information. Same thing with email. If you're disclosing uh, an email uh, URL or an email address, even though you're not disclosing the person's name per se, that's still individually identifiable health information if it's linked somehow to show that it's uh, linked to the person's health care or payment for their health care. All right, let's talk about the use and disclosure rules. HIPAA generally says, when it comes to the privacy rule, you cannot use, access, or disclose protected health information unless you've got the patient's written authorization or you fit within the HIPAA exception, okay? So the general rule is if you don't need to access it, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be looking at that information. You shouldn't disclose it outside your organization unless you fit within a, a HIPAA exception or you have the patient's authorization and you've got to implement reasonable safeguards to protect against improper disclosures or use. Let's talk about the first exception. The first exception says that you may use or disclose a patient's protected health information without the patient's authorization, so long as that is for your own treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. As long as it's for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, you don't need the patient's authorization. In addition, you may disclose protected health information to another covered entity for that other covered entity's treatment or payment purposes and for certain operations, but only if you satisfy certain criteria that you both have a, a relationship with the patient. Now, there are certain exceptions for this huge exception for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. That's the most important one you're going to deal with. But that exception does not apply to psychotherapy notes. Now, psychotherapy notes are not mental health notes. Psychotherapy notes are a subset of mental health notes. They're basically the notes that the, the uh, psychotherapist uses themselves for their own personal use to generate other records. And those psychotherapy notes have to be kept separate from any other records. Most of the time, you're never gonna be dealing with psychotherapy notes. It is not mental health records. Mental health records are protected health records, just like other HIPAA stuff. They don't get special protection under HIPAA. It's only the psychotherapy notes, and that is a very, very, very small subset that you probably never see and never have to deal with. There is another exception under HIPAA that says that, hey, 
Even though you're not required to use or disclose protected health information for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, if you go to the patient and say, well, I know we're not, we don't need your authorization, but I'll tell you what, we're not going to use or disclose your information, even for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations without your consent, then guess what? You've got to live up to that. So you cannot use or disclose protected health information if you for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations if you have agreed with the patient that you would not do so. My advice to you is never, ever agree to such a limit because I'll bet you you don't think about that applying to things like bills or whatever, um, you know, claims submitting claims to third-party payers and all of that type of stuff. If you're promising the patient that you're not going to release that information without their consent, then you're going to have to get the patient's authorization to just make these third-party disclosures, and you don't want to do that. So my advice, never, ever agree to limit your ability to use or disclose protected health information for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. You may want to go back and look at your medical consent forms, the other intake forms, and make sure that it doesn't have statements to that effect that you're somehow limiting your ability and creating potential HIPAA liability. The next exception, HIPAA allows you to make disclosures to family members and others who are involved in the patient's health care or payment for their care without the patient's authorization, so long as you satisfy certain criteria. If the patient's present, you may make the disclosure if the patient either agrees that you can make the disclosure or the patient has the chance to object and doesn't object and otherwise, you know, indicates that it's okay under the circumstances. So, for example, if you go back into the, the room with the patient and the patient invites their significant other to come back with them, then you can assume that the patient is okay with you making disclosures in front of that other person. Now, if the patient is not present, then um, you the, the question is, if they're not present or not competent, not able to agree, then the question is, okay, did the patient ever object to such disclosures to this third party? If not, um, do you determine that the, the disclosure is in the patient's best interest? If so, then you can go ahead and make that disclosure, even though the patient's not present. You don't need any kind of a written thing from the patient on this. This is just kind of the general one that recognizes the fact that, hey, sometimes, you know, it's okay to make disclosures to family members or others involved in the patient's health care. Um, so long as the patient was given a chance to object, they didn't object, and you think it's reasonable under the circumstances. Now, a couple of points on that, though. You have to limit that disclosure to the scope of that other person's involvement. Um, and um, another point on that is... In the wake of um, the High Tech Act, they extended this to deceased persons. It used to be that when it came to deceased persons, generally you could disclose it to, to um, the personal representative, but we're nervous about disclosing it to others. Under High Tech, as long as the patient did not give you contrary instructions while they were alive, you can disclose information about a deceased person to family members or others involved in the patient's care who were involved in the patient's care prior to the patient's death. All right, that's another exception then. A third exception is you can use or disclose protected health information for use of a facility directory. This is the one that allows, you know, a hospital who's visiting, a, or a, somebody who's visiting a patient in the hospital, they can go up to the pink lady at the desk and say, hey, is, is John Smith here? And that's, this is the exception that allows her to make that disclosure. That, yes, he's up in room whatever. There are limits on this though. You may disclose limited information for the facility directory purposes if you gave the patient notice and the, uh, the, that you would do so and the patient does not object and the requester asks for the person by name, so it only applies to those who show up and ask for the patient by name. If the patient on the other hand says that they want to be a do not publish, then you can't rely on this. If the patient's unable to agree or object, you may use or disclose that limited information for those directory purposes if it's consistent with the patient's prior wishes and you determine that it's not, uh, that it's in the patient's best interest. So if the patient on prior occasions never indicated that they wanted to be a, a do not dis, uh, publish, then you could go ahead and use the information. Uh, the disclosures that you are going to allow for under this facility directory though are limited. You can only disclose the patient's name, their location and their facility, their general condition, and if it's a minister who's asking about it, you can disclose their religion. All right, next group of exceptions. These are all those exceptions that appear in 164.512. Generally, they are exceptions that relate to public health or government functions. For example, HIPAA allows you to make a disclosure to the extent another law requires the disclosure. You just need to make sure that you're con acting consistent with that other law that requires the disclosure. 
Now note that this exception only applies if the other law requires the disclosure. For example, in Idaho, we have a law that allows a uh, physician to report a, a patient to the Department of Transportation, Transportation if they think that this person is a, not a safe driver. Note that that law allows it, it does, does not require it. And therefore, under HIPAA, it would that you cannot make that disclosure pursuant to that law because HIPAA is more strict. And HIPAA says that you must, you, this exception only applies if the law requires the disclosure. There's a separate HIPAA exception. You can make a disclosure to prevent a serious and imminent threat of harm. Um, quick note that there's actually a proposed uh, changes out there under HIPAA that would actually make it uh, reduce that from this th standard of serious and imminent threat of harm to something less than that. But we'll have to watch and see how that comes out. Note that, that in order to trigger that, that uh, disclosure has to be made to somebody who can actually allevi alleviate that threat of harm, like the police or something like that, not just the local news media. There's another a bunch of HIPAA exceptions that allow you to make disclosures for public health activities. Those are the things like you know, COVID reporting, that type of stuff, there, or um, reporting child abuse or neglect. There's another exception that uh, applies to health oversight activities. This is the one that allows you or requires you to make disclosures if the surveyors come on to survey your facility or if the Board of Medicine comes in to investigate a provider. This is the one that allows you to make disclosures for those entities. There's another one that allows you to make disclosures for judicial or administrative proceedings, either pursuant to a court order or warrant if it's signed by a judge or pursuant to subpoena if it's not signed by the judge. Now, there are some additional steps that you have to jump through. Just because you get a subpoena, if it's not signed by the judge, doesn't mean that you can go ahead and turn the information over. Instead, you would generally have to obtain satisfactory written assurances that the patient's been given notice and an opportunity to object, and the objections have been ruled against. Or you notify the patient yourself and tell them, hey, I got a subpoena. I'm going to have to respond unless you take action to get this quashed. If you don't let me know, then I'm going to have to respond by the by the um, return date. By doing that, you put the burden on them and it's their obligation to go ahead and respond. There are a bunch of exceptions that apply to law enforcement situations, but they only apply in certain situations. Just because law enforcement shows up at your facility and wants information doesn't mean that you can turn it over. You would have to make sure that they fit within a HIPAA exception. Either they've got a warrant or they can fit within one of the other exceptions, like an exception, for example, if they are uh, if you're reporting a crime on the premises at your facility, or an exception if they represent that they need that the police need that information to locate or apprehend a, uh, a fugitive. But the key there is make sure that you work with your privacy officer to ensure that the conditions for those disclosures have been satisfied. All right, those are the general HIPAA exceptions. So under the HIPAA rule, General rule is you can't use or disclose or access protected health information unless you've got the patient's written authorization or they fit within a HIPAA exception. We just talked about the exceptions. Let's talk about the HIPAA authorization. HIPAA allows you, that's the catch all, right? You generally need the patient's written authorization before you can use or disclose protected health information. In order for that uh, valid authorization, that authorization to be valid. It's got to, cannot be combined with any other documents. It's got to be a standalone document, so it can't be part of a consent with the limited exception of a research project. That authorization has to contain certain required elements that are all put, set forth in 164.508. If you haven't pulled out and looked at your HIPAA authorization recently, you really had ought to do it and compare it to the requirements in 164.508 to make sure that it's still valid because those tend to morph over time. Or you can go onto my website and I've got a checklist for valid HIPAA authorizations that you can download and look. Now, there are certain uses or disclosures that require a written authorization. For example, use or disclosure of psychotherapy notes, but as I mentioned, that's such a small set that almost never comes up. For marketing purposes, you generally need the patient's written authorization for the sale of protected health information, for certain research purposes, or generally for all other uses or disclosures unless one of those other regulatory exception applies that we just talked about. Uh, so make sure that you've got that written authorization. If you don't fit within one of those other exceptions, make sure that your authorization complies with the rules.
Let's talk briefly about employee vaccinations, tests, et cetera, because this is a common issue that seems to come up, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. HIPAA generally applies anytime you're rendering care as a healthcare provider, even though you may not think you're rendering care. So if you're providing employment physicals or IMEs or administering vaccinations to your hospital, you're administering vaccinations to your employees, well, in those situations, you are acting as a healthcare provider and therefore HIPAA applies. And that means that HIPAA says you cannot use or disclose that information that you got in that context as a healthcare provider. You can't use or disclose it unless you fit within one of those HIPAA exceptions or you have the patient's authorization. The net result is if you are a healthcare provider and you got information, health information about your own employees in your capacity as a healthcare provider, so maybe you're a hospital, you've had employees who've come to that your hospital to receive treatment as patients, you provide a treatment, you can't use their treatment records for employment-related purposes without the patient's authorization unless you get, unless you fit within one of those other HIPAA exceptions. The key here is if you are going to be involved in doing employee vaccinations, um, employee drug screens, employee independent medical exams, make sure that you get the patient's authorization uh, before you do that so that you can rely on that authorization and make the disclosures to the employer or whoever else you need to. All right, let's talk briefly about marketing. Remember the general rule under HIPAA is you've got to have the patient's authorization to engage in marketing. Marketing is generally defined as any communication that encourages another to buy or use a product or service, except, and here's the key, the following are not uh, defined as marketing and therefore you don't need an authorization for these purposes. If you're going to describe your own product or service, then that's not considered marketing. That's considered, you know, healthcare operations, maybe treatment purposes. Or if you're going to make that recommendation for purposes of treatment or healthcare operations, that's not marketing. Or for case management, care coordination, that type of stuff, it's not considered marketing. You don't need the patient's authorization unless, unless in those situations, you're getting paid by a third party in order to make those communications. So the general rule is for marketing, got to have the patient's authorization. It's not marketing if you're just describing your own product or service or recommending something for treatment purposes, unless in those situations where you're describing your own product or you're recommending something for treatment related, you're, if you're getting paid to make those recommendations, then it does become marketing and you would need the patient's authorization. All right, let's talk about personal representatives, okay? These are the, the, you know, the parents, guardians, those situations. How do you treat those under HIPAA? Well, the general rule under HIPAA is you treat the personal representative as if they were the patient. So because the patient can always access the information or request amendments to their information or exercise those other patient rights, the personal representative also has those rights. That means you can make those disclosures to the personal representative. Now, a personal representative is a person with the authority under state law to make health care decisions for the patient or if the patient's deceit to make health care decisions about the patient's estate. So to determine whether or not a person is a personal representative under HIPAA, you have to know what your state law requires in order to give them authority to make decisions about the patient. If they can make decisions about the patient for their health care, then they ought to be able to control or have access to the information the patient's protected health information to enable them to make those decisions, right? So that's the test. Do they have the authority to make healthcare decisions under state law? For example, in Idaho, we have a statute that, I, that lists in hierarchy form those who can make decisions for the patient. If a court-appointed guardian, if there's no court-appointed guardian, an agent with a durable power of attorney, if there's no agent, then a spouse, if there's no spouse, then an adult child, if there's no adult child, then a parent. These would be the personal representatives and you would be able to, HIPAA would allow you to make disclosures to them. Not only would HIPAA allow you, HIPAA would require you to make the disclosures if they come and ask for it because the personal representative has the right to access the patient's information just like the patient would. You treat them as if they were the patient. That's the general rule. There are limited circumstances where you can choose not to treat the personal representative as if they were the patient. One would be in the case of a minor, if the minor has authority to consent to their own health care, then they don't have a personal representative because the personal representative 
They, you don't need them. The, the patient can consent to their own health care. That means the authority of the personal representative isn't triggered. If the minor obtains care at the direction of a court or a person appointed by the court, then again, you don't need the personal representative, so you don't disclose to the personal representative. If the parent agrees that the provider may have a confidential relationship, so it may be a situation where you as a parent taking your minor child, you, tell, you know that the, the patient's, your minor child's not gonna make full disclosure to the, to the physician unless, um, unless they know that that, con that information is gonna be confidential. So you as a parent could agree, okay, provider, I agree that whatever the patient tells you, you can keep confidential. In that situation, you don't have to treat the parent as the personal representative. Or finally, if you determine that treating the personal representative as the patient is not in the best interest of the patient, maybe you think that the parent's an abuser or that situation, then in those situations, you can choose not to treat the personal representative as if they were the individual and you could deny their access to um, get that information. The government has actually posted pretty helpful guidance in dealing with this whole situation about making disclosures to family and friends and others. That's a common issue that you guys deal with. If you would like to, you can go in there and access that on the government's website, or you can go to my website and I've got an article dealing with those disclosures to family members and others involved in the care. All right, let's talk about business associates. So when HIPAA originally came out, HIPAA only applied to covered entities, but the government was concerned about situations where, well, what about business associates to whom the covered entity gives their information? HIPAA did not extend to them. So originally HIPAA said, well, okay, we can't directly cover those business associates. So what we're going to require you to do, we can govern you covered entities. So we're gonna say you can't make disclosures to those business associates unless you have a business associate agreement with them that essentially requires them to um, comply with HIPAA. So that's how we got this whole business associate agreement. Now, since that time, when HITECH came out in 2013, they um, actually extended HIPAA. So now business associates are directly covered I question why we still need the business associates agreements, but nevertheless, the law still requires us to get business associate agreements. So HIPAA says that you may disclose protected health information to a business associate if you have a valid business associate agreement. If you fail to have a valid business associate agreement, then you could be liable for whatever misconduct that that uh, business associate, if they breach, then you could be liable for what that business associate does. As a technical matter, the law does not necessarily support that, but that hasn't stopped the OCR from essentially imposing vicarious liability on covered entities who failed to have business associate agreements in place. The bottom line is you better have your business associate agreement in place or you may be exposed to liability for whatever that business associate does. Well, who are business associates? Business associates are entities that create, receive, maintain, or transmit protected health information on behalf of a covered entity. It's these persons that you want to give or create protected health information for you to do something on your behalf. It could include covered entities who are acting as your business associate. It also includes subcontractors of those business associates who are doing something on your behalf. The key there is to make sure that it's the business associates doing something for you on your behalf, okay? They are your business associate. If you simply got another doctor out there that's providing their own health care and they want your records, well, they're not your business associate. They're not providing that care on your behalf. They're just another covered entity out there doing their stuff. Uh, payers, third-party payers. You may disclose information to a third-party payer, but they are not your business associate. They're just doing their stuff as a third-party payer. You're not disclosing it for, they're not providing those services on your behalf, so they are not business associates. Again, on my website, I've got uh, decision tree and other information about uh, identifying business associates and the like. But the key there is just realize that, hey, if you're disclosing this information to this other entity so that other entity can do something for you on your behalf as your agent, as your contractor, then in that situation, they're probably going to be a business associate and you have to have this business associate agreement in place with them. That business associate agreement has to satisfy certain criteria. The um, 45 CFR 164.502 and 504 have a certain list of criteria that uh, terms that have to appear in your business associate agreement. Beware of situations where a business associate takes your information and uses it for their own purposes. That is a breach because under the business associate agreement, as well as the HIPAA rules, 
it only allows that business associate to use your information to perform functions on your behalf. If that business associate is then going beyond that and using it for their own staff, then that is a violation of their obligations. As long as you had your business associate agreement in place and you didn't know that they were out there violating it, you're not going to be liable for what they did. But if you do know that they're in, using this stuff improperly and fail to act, then you can be li liable for uh, that business associate's misconduct. As far as the terms in that business associate, the OCR has published sample business associate agreement provisions. So if you don't otherwise have one, you can go to the website here and you can use the sample that um, the government has produced. I don't like their sample. I think it creates more liability for you than you otherwise are required to take on. But um, there you go. Um, I've got separate uh, resources, including sample business associate agreements and a checklist for required business associate terms. If you need it, just let me know or go to my website and you can access it there. All right, next requirement. HIPAA says, okay, under the rules, you can go ahead and make these disclosures under these limited circumstances. You fit within an exception, or maybe you've got the authorization. HIPAA still says that you've got to take reasonable steps to verify that the entity to whom you are disclosing is the right person that you can disclose it to. So you've got to verify the identity and the authority of the person requesting the information if they're not known to you to make sure that they are appropriate to disclose. So if you've got a situation where you're treating a minor, the parent comes in, they're the personal representative, but you don't know they're the parent. You just need to take reasonable steps to verify that they are who they say they are. Maybe asking for the child's birth date, social security number, something like that, something reasonable. Um, the government has specifically said when it comes to patient portals, you need to put in appropriate portal uh, protections in the portals so that you can verify that whoever has access to that, that they are really the person who should be having access to that. HIPAA also says, okay, even though HIPAA would allow you to make the disclosure, we don't want you disclosing more than the minimum necessary. So even though HIPAA allows you to use this for purposes of treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, we don't want you to use or disclose more than is minimally necessary for those permissible purposes. Now that minimum necessary standard does not apply to disclosures to the patient or their personal representative, if they're getting it under that, to a disclosures to another provider for treatment, we don't want you to have to second guess whether or not that other provider really needs that other information for an individual's authorization, but you can only disclose per the authorization or to the extent that the disclosure is required by law. But again, you can only make the disclosure to the extent it's required by law. Um, in addition to um, implementing this, you've got to uh, adopt minimum necessary policies. Uh, I bet you if I went into your facilities, a lot of you do not have the required minimum necessary policies. Those policies are supposed to identify those persons who have a need to know and make sure that the that uh, access is limited accordingly. All right, that is the use and disclosure rules. The use and disclosure, or HIPAA also gives the patient certain rights concerning their health information. The first is a patient has a right to receive a notice of privacy practices. That's that document you have to provide to them when they first show up at your practice, or if they're getting it online, you've got to make uh, have a way so that you can give them that notice of privacy process, uh, practices during the first interaction. Note that in the proposed rule that's out there lurking, it would change some of the requirements for notice of privacy practices. Among other things, um, right now you're required to give, make a good faith effort to give the patients, get the patients acknowledgement that they've um, received the notice of privacy practices. Under the proposed rule, you would not be required to get that acknowledgement any longer. The next right is a patient has a right to request restrictions on your use or disclosure of protected health information for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations. But this is important. The patient only has a right to request those restrictions. You don't have to agree to them. And per our prior discussion, you should never agree to those restrictions, okay? You gotta allow the patient to request it, but you don't have to agree to it. Now, if you do agree to it, you're gonna be bound by those agreements and it's gonna create problems for you. So don't agree to those restrictions. The next patient right, a patient has a right to receive communications by alternative means or at alternative locations. So if they want you, for example, to send your bill to them in a sealed envelope without a return address, if it's reasonable, you've got to do that, okay? A next, next right, this is the big one, a patient has a right to access their protected health information, not all their information, just the information that's maintaining the designated record set. A designated record set is essentially that information that's used to make decisions concerning the patient's healthcare 
or payment for their health care. The patient has a right to access that information or obtain a copy of that information subject to very limited exceptions, including an exception if it's not in the patient's best interest, but even in that situation, the patient has to have that a right to have that decision reviewed. Now, this right to access, the OCR is really um, targeting this right now. Um, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Next patient right is a patient has a right to uh, get an amendment of their health information. So if they look at this and say, hey, this information is not correct, they have a right to request that amendment. Now, you don't have to make that amendment if, for certain circumstances, including if the information is correct. But even then, you would have to document that the patient requested that, the patient has a right to have their request attached to the medical record, and it becomes part of the medical record. Finally, a patient has a right to request a request an accounting of disclosures of their protected health information that you've made during the prior um, six year period. I think it's six years. Boy, I better go back and take a look at that. Um, but as far as the accounting of disclosures, um, there are exceptions to that. You don't have to do an accounting of disclosures for disclosures you've made for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations, at least under the current rules. You don't have to make an accounting of disclosures for uh, pursuant to the patient's authorizations or disclosures to the patient. That's most of your accounting. Basically, you'd have to account for disclosures that were made improperly or certain disclosures like under 45 CFR 164.512, those disclosures to law enforcement and those types of situations. So the patient has a right to come in there and request that you provide them with this accounting of these disclosures that you've made of their information subject to those exceptions. All right, let's go back to the individual's right to access their information, as I mentioned. Uh, this is a high priority for the Office for Civil Rights. A few years ago, they published this guidance and the individual's rights under HIPAA to access their health information. This is critical reading. If you are a public, uh, if you are a privacy officer or a health information manager, you need to make sure that you read this guidance and you understand the OCR's take on this right to access their information. The OCR actually has a, a right of access initiative right now. I think that they just published their 44th um, case where they've imposed penalties or uh, had a settlement because of an entity's failure to provide a patient with access to their information consistent with the rules. Now, most of those situations where the, the um, covered entities had to pay, it's been situations where the patient has complained and the covered entity has ignored it, but um, you know it could apply in other situations. Just make sure you're aware of the, your obligations to uh, give the patient access to their information. There's a deadline. Uh, currently, you have to provide that information within 30 days. You can get a 130-day extension, so up to 60 days. However, if it's electronic information, beware that the information blocking rule, it probably requires you to provide that information quicker than the 30 days. That's a situation where um, the information blocking rule is more restrictive or it gives the patient greater rights than HIPAA does. So in the information blocking rule commentary, it specifically says in the FAQs that um, you can't simply wait for the 30 days under HIPAA if the information blocking rule requires you to disclose that in an earlier time. A uh, quick comment here. When uh, in the omnibus rule that came out in 2013, they added a provision that basically says, hey, as part of the patient's right to access, the patient also has a right to direct you to make disclosures of their information to third parties. And if you do that, then that's just part of the patient's right to access, which means that um, you've got a, only 30 days to do that. And um, under the right of access, you can only charge a patient reasonable cost-based fees for making those disclosures. You can't just charge them some kind of a fee schedule that's not linked to, to reasonable cost-based fees. So in the HITECH Act, they basically said, or excuse me, in the omnibus rule, they basically said that this, this is part of the right to access. Well, in the Siox case that came out, um, the federal court slapped back the Office for Civil Rights, said that they went a bit too far. They exceeded the scope of High Tech Act and what they did. They didn't go through appropriate rulemaking. And therefore, here's the net of this rule, that if it's electronic protected health information maintained in your EHR and the patient says, I want you to send it to a third party, then you're obligated to do that. And it's part of the patient's right to access. You got to do that within 30 days. However, you are not limited to charging a reasonable cost-based fee as if you were providing that information to the patient. That's for electronic protected health information. For hard copy information or other protected health information that's not electronic, 
you are not required to send that request to the third party. They said that, that it was exceeded the scope of the High Tech Act and OCR shouldn't have gone that far. Now, a word about that. In the proposed rules, they would change those requirements to um, basically go back to allow the patient to require you to, to make those disclosures, but we don't have that final rule yet. All right. The privacy rule also imposes certain administrative requirements. Among other things, each of you must have in writing designated who your privacy officer and who your security officer is. So you should have this designation of privacy officers so that the government shows up that they can ask, okay, let me see your designation so that they can designate in writing who they are. You've got to implement policies and procedures, policies and safeguards to take reasonable steps to protect your information, but it's only reasonable steps. Now that's important because if you have an incidental disclosure, something that just a patient overhears, but you otherwise have implemented reasonable safeguards, then that is not a HIPAA breach. That is not a violation of the privacy rule. That just that sometimes just happens. But that only applies if you've implemented these reasonable policies and safeguards. You've got to train your workforce and document your training. You've got to respond timely to complaints. You've got to mitigate violations to the extent you can. And you've got to maintain documents that are required by HIPAA for six years. Now, those are just the HIPAA documents, like your notice of privacy practices, your authorizations, your designation of privacy officer, that stuff. It's not medical records. HIPAA does not require you to maintain your medical records for six years. It's only these HIPAA documents that you're required to maintain for six years. All right, as I mentioned, the government has proposed rules that would, it's the most significant changes to HIPAA, really the only at least regulatory changes since we've had, since the omnibus rule in 2013, despite what you may be giving out there on some advertisements. Um, these proposed rules, uh, the government's issued the proposed rules, but they haven't finalized them. Under the proposed rules, as I mentioned, they would strengthen the individual's right of access. Among other things, they would give the patient a right to come in and use their cell phone to take photos of images. Um, it would require you to respond within 15 days to a patient's request to access, not 30 days. It would require the providers to share information with third parties when they're directed by the patient. It further limits the charges that you can charge a patient for giving them uh, their information. Um, there are certain other things, the changes that are made to facilitate individualized care coordination. It clarifies the ability to disclose to avert a threat of harm, so it's not such a high standard. It's a lesser standard to make disclosures to avoid harm. And it would modify the requirements concerning notices of privacy practices. We don't have the final rule yet. Not sure where it is in the process, uh, other than it's been lurking out there for over two years now. Just watching, it should be coming down before too awfully long, we would think. All right. In addition to that stuff, there have been some recent guidance that the OCR has issued in the wake of the Dobbs decision and the abortion stuff and reproductive rights in um, in June of 2022, they issued some guidance dealing with um, reproductive rights. Basically, they just reemphasized HIPAA and said, hey, there's nothing in HIPAA that requires you to make disclosures to law enforcement and the like when it comes to reproductive rights. Their, their guidance is a little bit misleading because they say there's nothing in HIPAA that requires you to make those disclosures. Well, that's true, but they failed to go on. Well, they didn't do a very good job of explaining, but if there's another law that requires you to make those disclosures, then HIPAA doesn't prevent it. Well, because that didn't get them where they necessarily need to go, um, in April of 2023, just last uh, couple of months ago, OCR proposed a new rule that would prohibit covered entities and business associates from using and disclosing PHI to make certain disclosures concerning rep reproductive rights um, in criminal and civil investigations. Basically, if um, a person is going to receive abortion or other reproductive rights care in a state, um, where it is not illegal, then it, HIPAA prevents you from making disclosures concerning that in a state where it may be illegal, that they can't use that information to prosecute somebody from out of state to, to where they're getting the care where it's legal. The bottom line is uh, just be aware that there's these additional requirements. It's, it's out there that, again, these are proposed rules. We'll have to see how this shakes out. Um, in addition, in uh, December of this last year, in 2022, the OCR issued guidance concerning tracking. Um, this is a big deal. 
to the, they said that, hey, if you're engaging vendors and these vendors are using cookies or other pixels to track, um, you know, where this data, people who are accessing this information, that that may violate HIPAA. So you need to make sure that um, if you are using, your vendors are using any of this tracking technology or you're using tracking technology, that it is compliant with HIPAA, that it is being used for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations and not for improper purposes like marketing without the patient's authorization or these other things. You would want to make sure that your business associates aren't using this information you're giving them to engage in this additional tracking stuff that um, is not permitted by HIPAA. So it, it raised kind of a big flurry uh, back in December. If you haven't looked at that, this is something you need to consider. All right, that is the privacy rule. Let's move on to the security rule. We're gonna have to go through this pretty quickly, partly because I am not a tech guru. Just know this, the big picture, the security re rule requires the following. You've got to conduct a risk assessment of your electronic protected health information systems. That has to be done on a periodic basis. It's not necessarily annually. They don't tell you how often, but you need, to, you know, once 10 years ago is not sufficient. Um, the key guidance is, or the clear indication is, this needs to be done periodically, maybe annually is, you know, certainly best practices is as you modify your system, you need to be perpetually looking at these security um, concerns and you want to document that risk assessment. Next, you've got to admit it, uh, implement specified administrative, technical and physical safeguards to protect your stuff. Those safeguards are all set out in the, um, in the HIPAA security rule. And finally, you've got to execute business associate agreements. Now, important point, this HIPAA security rule is designed not only to protect the confidentiality of your information, but also to protect its integrity and its availability. So you're not gonna be subject to hackers who come in there and suddenly corrupt all of your data or ransomware that locks up all of your data, or you don't have a fire and suddenly all of your data is gone. The HIPAA security rule is designed to protect all of that stuff. So regardless of whether or not there are regulatory requirements, these are the things you folks need to be doing just as a good business matter. So that's kind of the overview of what the security rule requires. A key to that, again, is that security risk assessment. You don't have to pay a, a contractor, you know, $20,000 to come in and help you with that. You can if you want, or you can just go to the government's website here. They have their own do-it-yourself risk assessment tool that you can use to help you do that and document that risk assessment. Um, the government has a whole bunch of uh, resources available for you dealing with the security rule. Uh, some of those favorites are on the HHS healthit.gov website. Um, also, the OCR has a bunch of it on the TIPA website. You can use those um, and periodically re-review those with your information security team to make sure that you're complying. Now, um, another point. In in um, January of 2021, the High Tech Act amendments required the OCR to, you know, because if you get in, if you violate the security rule, that's really where your big ticket penalties come in. If you look at the, you know, multi-million dollar penalties, those are because of the HIPAA security rule violations, because there's, you know, hundreds or thousands of uh, patients that are affected. Um, as part of the High Tech Act, the government said, okay, OCR, when you're considering imposing those penalties, you've got to uh, consider whether or not that covered entity is um, their compliance with recognized security practices, okay, the RSPs. That's a factor in determining HIPAA penalties. Well, we didn't have the RSPs until in October of last year, the OCR posted a video addressing what those RSPs were. So if you haven't looked at this, you and your IT folks ought to look at this video and it gives you guidance concerning what are considered these RSPs. Now these RSPs, compliance with the RSPs are not a safe harbor, but if you're complying with those RSPs, then that's going to be give you added protection in, in defending against um, HIPAA penalties. More importantly, it's gonna protect your, your data, which is really what you need to do. Um, the RSP resources that have been approved by the OCR are these standards that are identified up there on your screen. Hopefully that makes sense to your information security officer that they understand what those are. If not, they should become familiar with those. A word about encryption. Encryption is an addressable standard. That means, means that your uh, 
The assumption is, is that all of your electronic protected health information, whether it's data at rest or data in transit, needs to be encrypted. That's stuff on USBs, that's stuff sitting on your computers, whatever. It's supposed to be encrypted. It's an addressable standard, so it's not mandatory that you do that. But if, if you don't encrypt it, then you've got to come up, you've got to do an analysis to uh, come up with other ways that protect it as, as well as encryption does, and that just doesn't work. Now, encryption is really important because if it's encrypted, then it's deemed to be secured. That means that if you lose it or if there's a breach, there's not a breach of unsecured protected health information. So if you lose encrypted, properly encrypted data, that is not going to require a breach notification. So that's another reason why you want to encrypt it. Um, the government, when it comes to encryption, be especially sensitive to mobile devices. The government has a whole website warning um, healthcare providers about uh, uh, mobile devices. Case in point, there's uh, one of the settlements that came out was uh, a business associate lost a cell phone um, that contained and had a bunch of unencrypted data, a bunch of data about uh, patients on it, and the government ended up uh, requiring the covered entity to pay about a million dollars because of that. So make sure that you are aware of your mobile devices, that the most mobile devices, if and to the extent they maintain protected health information, that they are properly encrypted. All right. Uh, let's talk briefly about the end of the public health emergency. During the public health emergency, um, the government realized that, hey, we've got to do more telehealth, and therefore we're going to relax the HIPAA security rules for providing these telehealth services. So it allowed you to use a lot of these platforms to provide telehealth like Zoom or FaceTime um, or Messenger or things like that that did not satisfy the security rule, but the government said, okay, we'll allow you to do it during the emergency. Well, the emergency is now over. And so the OCRs confirmed that those relaxed security standards, they ended on May 11th, but the OCR is gonna give you an additional 90 days to transition. So by August 9th, that's the deadline. You need to make sure that to the extent you're, you're using these platforms to communicate that you are, that they are compliant with the security rule effective August 9th, 2023. A quick word about emailing or texting. This is a common problem I see out there. You know, you, everybody wants to email, everybody wants to text, but if you're sending email or text in an uh, unencrypted email platform or an un unencrypted text, including just regular SMS, that is a violation of the security rule because it is supposed to be encrypted. Now, if you're sending that back and forth with the patient, that's okay, as long as you've notified the patient of the risk and the patient agrees to it, you want to probably document that. But then HIPAA says, okay, you can go ahead and do that because the patient has a right to request communications by alternative means, including unsecured texts or unsecured emails. But that exception does not necessarily apply to your communications with other providers or other employees or the things. General rule there is that stuff needs to be encrypted. If you are, your providers are communicating back and forth with you um, via unencrypted email or text, that is a violation of the HIPAA security rules. All of that stuff leads me to cybersecurity, which is a huge issue. In Idaho, we just had a hospital get shut down for a little while because of cybersecurity. Everything that we talked about with the security rule, I mean, it's important for HIPAA compliance. It's far more important to protect your data for cybersecurity. That's why you really need to do this. The government has really been pushing cybersecurity um, recently, they provided a whole bunch of resources that I've identified here in the slides. Um, if you haven't done so, spend time with the government's um, websites, the stuff that I've sent to you. Uh, make sure your information security are, are aware of this, because if you do have a situation where you're not complying, you have a cyber attack, hey, there's a good chance you could get hit up with pretty significant HIPAA penalties. There was a, a hospital that got hit up with $3 million HIPAA penalties because of a cyber attack. The government found out that or came in there and concluded that they did not have the appropriate security stuff in place. More important than those HIPAA penalties, though, are you just can't function without um, your data. You can risk the lives of your patients, your continued operations. You need to comply with the security rule, not necessarily just for HIPAA compliance, but just to protect yourself. All right, that brings us to the breach notification rule. Under the breach notification, HIPAA says if there is a breach of unsecured protected health information, the covered entity must notify 
each individual whose unsecured information has been or is reasonably believed to have been accessed, acquired, used, or disclosed in violation of the privacy rule. In addition, anytime you notify the individual, you also have to notify HHS. The only difference is the timing. And if the breach involves more than 500 persons in a particular state, you've got to notify local media. If you're a business associate who discovers a breach, you have to notify the covered entity so the covered entity can give this required notice. The key here is understanding when it applies. What is a breach and what is unsecured protected health information? Well, unsecured protected health information is just information that has not been secured. The net effect of that is it's security, it's completely destroyed, but then how can it ever be disclosed if that's the case? Or more importantly, for electronic data, it's encrypted. If it's encrypted, then it's secured and you don't need to worry about the breach notification. If it's not encrypted, then it is unsecured. And if you lose it, or if it's been improperly accessed, there is likely a breach and it's gonna trigger those breach reporting requirements. All right, so the first test, is it secured? The second is whether or not there is a breach. Under the rule, a breach is the acquisition, access, use or disclosure of protected health information in violation of the privacy rule. Note that in order for it to be a reportable breach, it has to be a violation of the privacy rule, not necessarily the security rule. You may have a security rule violation that doesn't result in any um, unexpected access, use or disclosure of protected health information, so it wouldn't be reportable. It only applies to a violation of the privacy rule. Now, that unauthorized acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of protected health information in violation of the privacy rule is presumed to be a breach. So it's presumed that you're going to have to report it unless you demonstrate that there's a low probability that the data has been compromised. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means based on a risk assessment of the following factors. The first is the nature and the extent of the information involved. For example, if all it was was the name that the person was got care at a hospital, and it's a general hospital, well, you could probably conclude that there's a low probability. There was a breach, but there's a low probability that that has been compromised. On the other hand, if it's the name of a person who got care at a particular type of facility, including like a mental health facility, greater likelihood that it's, it's a reportable breach. Second factor, who got the information? If it's another healthcare provider who got it, who's otherwise gonna keep it confidential, they just got it mistakenly and they confirm that they've destroyed the facts or whatever, probably safe. On the other hand, if it went to the Russian mafia, then bigger concerns. Third factor, whether the information was actually acquired or viewed. And fourth, the extent to which the risk of the PHA has been mitigated. Okay, so those are the factors that you would analyze in determining whether or not the breach is reportable. And again, on my website, I've got a couple of articles that talk about the factors and go into more detail about examples of what is reportable and what's not reportable. Now, HIPAA does have some exceptions to the breach reporting. Again, if there's loss of secured data, like it's properly encrypted, that's not going to be reportable because it's not a breach of unsecured protected health information. If there's an incidental disclosure, for example, as I mentioned earlier, as long as some, if somebody just happens to overhear something, but you had otherwise reasonable security protections in place, you have the safeguards in place and somebody just overhears something, that's not a violation of the privacy rule and therefore it's not a um, reportable breach. And the breach is defined to exclude certain circumstances where basically, yeah, you make a wrong disclosure to somebody within your organization, but it didn't go outside the organization, kind of a no harm, no foul situation, then you may be able to avoid it there. If there was a breach, if you do that analysis and you conclude, yeah, there is a, more than a low probability that that has been compromised, then you have to give notice. The notice to the individual has to be made without unreasonable delay, but no more than 60 days from the discovery. That doesn't mean that you can sit on it for 60 days and make the report. If you conclude your investigation in 14 days, you're supposed to make the breach report in 14 days. That notice to the individual has to be um, given by, uh, go to the individual, it has to be by mail, unless you get the patient's consent to send it by email. And it's gotta maintain, uh, contain certain data elements, including the description of the breach, the action taken in response, and suggested action that the individual should take to protect themselves. Anytime you have to give the notice to the individual, you're also going to have to notify HHS. The only difference is the timing. If the breach involves fewer than 500 persons, you don't have to give that breach report to the government until uh, 60 days after the end of the calendar year in which the breach occurred. So you can wait until the following March 1st to give that report. 
Um, hopefully then everybody else is given the report at the same time and it goes in like Raiders of the Lost Ark into the big warehouse and there's so many of these that the government never looks at them. Or alternatively, if the breach involves 500 or more persons, then you've got to notify HHS contemporaneously at the time you notify the individual. You do that report by going to this website and submitting it through the website. It's an electronic report. If the breach involves more than 500 persons, your name goes on the HHS wall of shame along with everybody else who's had those long breaches, and there you go. If the breach involves unsecure protective health information of more than 500 residents in a state, you've got to notify prominent media outlets. Again, without unreasonable delay, but no more than 60 days. Just make sure that when you're doing those reports to the media that you're not disclosing protected health information along the way. Um, if you're a business associate, that business associate has to notify the covered entity so the covered entity can give its breach reports. You have to do that within 60 days. If you're a covered entity, you probably want your business associate agreements to require them to make the report sooner than the 60 days so that you can make the report. In fact, you want it within the 30 days so that you can correct the situation and hopefully avoid any kind of uh, HIPAA penalties. All right, that's a quick summary of the major HIPAA rules. Just a couple of other things real quick. As I mentioned, data privacy, huge issue right now. There are federal proposed uh, federal rules that are out there or other data privacy issues working their way through the federal courts. Among other things, the uh, Cyber Incident Reporting Critical Infrastructure Act will be coming out with regulations that will require breach reports of um, security incidents. We don't have that yet, but stay tuned. There are a bunch of states that have implemented their own privacy laws. Um, most noteworthy probably is Washington, which is probably the most expansive, and it applies to entities not just in Washington, but entities outside of Washington. So beware of those state laws. The FTC is actively um, enforcing privacy issues under the Unfair Trade Practices Act. The theory there is, hey, if you're making representations about how you protect data and you don't, then the government can come after you the FTC TC can come after you for unfair trade practices or in a more general sense, you know, just data security is so important now. If you don't maintain that, then that can support a, an unfair trade practices act claim against you. And the government has used that to go after different entities, including GoodRx and, and other entities recently. Separate apart from that are the FTC health breach notification rules. These apply to healthcare vendors. The government, again, has used this to go after entities that aren't necessarily covered by HIPAA. Um, under the proposed rule, the, the FTC's proposed amendments to those health breach notification rules that confirms that that would be extended to health apps. So even if the health apps are not covered by HIPAA, they may be covered by these FTC rules. Um, states, all states have breach reporting statutes. Uh, most of these were patterned after a, a standard one that went out years ago. They are not specific to healthcare, but they could include healthcare. They generally require commercial entities to immediately investigate and notify affected persons if there is a breach of a computer system resulting in the illegal acquisition of certain unencrypted computerized information. It usually requires the, a, a name plus certain other identifiers like social security numbers, credit card numbers, pins or something. And there's an actual or reasonable likely misuse of the personal property. Um, States vary on what the penalties are, but generally, um, quite often, you'll see a fine like $25,000 if you fail to notify persons. Um, some Usually, they will have a provision that as long as you're complying with HIPAA or some other federal privacy law, when it comes to the breach notification, then you're deemed to satisfy those state laws. Um, 42 CFR Part 2, as I mentioned, these are the additional privacy laws that apply to substance use disorder programs. I'm not going to get into that today mainly because the SAMHSA has proposed new rules for 42 CFR Part 2. The good news is these new rules were designed to make uh, these substance use disorder records more consistent with the rules concerning HIPAA. So it, it kind of deflates and, and, and extends HIPAA to these kinds of records. HIPAA was always applied to them, but they, they reduce the standards. So if you comply with HIPAA, it makes it easier to comply with 42 CFR Part 2. We have not got the final rules yet. Watch for those final rules. We'll do a program on those when they come out. All right, real quickly, additional sources. As I mentioned, I, I don't golf. So I, instead, I like to write HIPAA articles. So there's a bunch of HIPAA stuff on my our website, uh, forms. Uh, 
a bunch of articles. You can access those for free. Got a bunch of client webinars and things like that on HIPAA issues. These may be good resources, free resources for you for your HIPAA training. Um, if you have questions on any of the things we talked about today, feel free to shoot me an email or use the chat feature and I'll respond offline. Otherwise, thank you very much. I hope you guys are doing well and uh, have a good summer.